So have you ever had a time in your life when you were caught failing? Like you didn't just fail and sweep it under the rug, but you were caught in the act. About a year ago, I was working from my home office when my husband knocked on the door and said that he had to go out for about a half an hour and he just needed me to watch our girls. And I said, yeah, no problem. It's, it's 30 minutes. That's absolutely fine. I've got this. And it wasn't about a minute after he left that I realized, oh, shoot, I had actually scheduled a phone call. And in my wisdom, I decided not to cancel this phone call, but actually to just try and navigate both. And so I go downstairs and I talk to my daughters and I explain the situation to them. And then I proceed to get them everything they could possibly need. I mean, I got them food and water, I turned on a movie, and if that didn't keep them occupied, I got crafts and paint and games on the table. I mean, I made sure there was toilet paper in the bathroom. I was totally prepared for the fact that I was not going to be present. And so I go back upstairs to my office, and I'm, I'm on my phone call with my colleague, and all of a sudden I hear a noise. And I think, well, I better go check on my girls. And so I walk down the stairs, and when I get to the bottom of my stairs, I'm horrified by what I see. I mean, it is absolute chaos down there. The furniture is overturned. There is water that is spilled and pouring off our table. There is food thrown everywhere. For some reason, my girls decided to take their clothes off. There was paint on the table and paint on the floor. And to my absolute delight, there was paint all the way down my ultra pure white curtains. I mean, side note, really, who leaves children unattended with paint? I mean, That's an epic mom fail in and of itself. And I'm looking around horrified and thinking, I have to clean this thing up before my husband gets home. And so I'm scurrying around, still on my work call, trying to get this done when Scarlett runs to me and she slips on the water and she starts sobbing. I quickly put my phone on mute and I know what to do because in my house, when one of our girls gets hurt, you know, they just need a Band-Aid. It doesn't matter if there's something visibly wrong or not, a Band-Aid makes everything better. So I move Scarlett, I go, I get her a Band-Aid, I I put it on her leg, I unmute my phone, I'm back in my meeting trying to clean everything up and Scarlett starts going, mommy, mommy, mommy. I'm like, what? And she's like, you've got to pray for my leg. I was like, oh, right, mute the phone, pray for her leg, unmute the phone. I'm back in my work meeting, cleaning things up, and Scarlett's going, mommy, 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 mute my phone, what? She's like, you prayed for the wrong leg. I was like, oh, right. So I I pray for the right leg, which is incidentally the left leg, and then I unmute my phone, I'm back at it, and I'm cleaning things up, kicking them with my foot, talking to my colleague, and I look up, and there's my husband. He's just staring at me. And I do really what any loving mother does, and I just kind of point at my kids like, I don't know what happened. But he knew that I failed, and I knew that I failed, and I felt terrible that I failed once I just stopped blaming my kids. You know, this feeling of failing is, is awful, and it's not something that we just have in our relationships and in our personal life but it's something that we experience in our faith, isn't it? And really, there's no worse feeling in the world than feeling like we have failed in our faith. And so the question is, what if there is a way to live our faith that we don't have to worry about failing? We're in week three of a series that we've called The Way of Jesus. And the faith calling that we've been talking about in this series is really high and it is really hard. And I wouldn't blame anyone here today for feeling like they just can't do it. Because as Mike said a few weeks ago, that the bad news of following Jesus is that in many ways life does get harder. But see, the bad news is actually the good news. And as we lose our lives, it is then that we find them. And as we open up our hands and pick up our cross, it is then that we become, we become the truest, most authentic version of ourselves. The one that God always created us to be. And then Jeff, last week, well, he talked about the way of glory and said that the way to experience God's glory is not just to be a fan of Jesus, but to follow him to trust him enough to to listen to him and to follow him in the way of of sacrifice and and servanthood and, yes, even suffering. 
And today we're going to keep going in our journey through Matthew. And if you have your Bible or your Bible app with you today, why don't you follow along with us? We're going to start in Matthew 17, verse 14. And it says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You see, right before this happened, Jesus left his nine disciples on the side of a mountain, and he took three of them to the top, Peter, James, and John. And at the top of the mountain, they had this glorious experience. They experienced the transfiguration that Jeff talked about last week. And when they're on the way down the mountain, they get to the bottom of the mountain where they left the other nine. And let's just say the scene that they encounter at the bottom of the mountain is nothing like the mountaintop experience they just had. I mean, it is messy and it is chaotic. There are people who are sick and hurting and arguing. And there are teachers of the law that are trying to discredit the disciples. And at the center of this crowd and the center of this story is a father and his son. The son is said to be suffering with seizures. You know, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, we see that he actually is foaming at the mouth, that he is grinding his teeth, that he has a rigid body and he's unable to speak. And in Luke, well, Luke talks about him crying out and experiencing convulsions. You see, on, on one hand, this boy's condition is described as epilepsy, but on the other hand, his condition is described as a demon. Now, that, that's not to say that every physical symptom that we have has demonic roots. That's not to say that at all. But I do a, a fair amount of traveling in my job outside of the Western world, and I find myself in various contexts where they have a holistic view of health and medicine, one that looks not just at the physical symptoms but at the spiritual symptoms as well. And that's really what... What Matthew is getting at here, he's saying that there are these physical symptoms, but there are also these, these spiritual symptoms as well. And I know that there are many people around here that would have a difficult time processing the idea of a, de a demon having authority over a young child, and rightfully so. And there are many different ways of thinking about this that are represented in the room today, but suffice it to say what Matthew's bottom line here is, is this boy was in bad shape. This boy was in trouble. And he's there with his father. You know, his, his father has explored every option. He's likely gone to the temple and talked to doctors and healers there. And somewhere along the way, he heard about the disciples sent on a mission of healing and restoration. And he hears of them helping other people's children. And he thinks, aha, they can do this. I'm going to go to them. And so he brings his suffering son to the disciples and he pleads with them and says, please, will you help my son? And you see the disciples, they're there to help. They want to help. Jesus has given them authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And they see that this boy is suffering and it grieves them. And so they draw him near to heal him and they fail. They fail. You can imagine how devastating it would have been for the disciples to fail. And even more devastating that it would have been for the father to watch the disciples to fail. Because really, what option does he have now? And that's when Jesus shows up on the scene, and the father sees him, and he, he beelines for Jesus, and he throws himself at his feet, and he begs for mercy for his son. And Jesus responds to the chaotic scene around him. And as it says in verse 17, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus is, is frustrated and he scolds the disciples who have reverted to the spiritual level of the crowd among them. The word perverse is the Greek word diastrepho, and it means 
twisted, crooked, bent out of shape. And Jesus is saying, you all have this warped understanding of who I am and of what this life of faith is all about. And then in verse 18, we see that Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. We see Jesus shows up and he gets the job done and he shows that he has the power and the authority to accomplish what seemed impossible only moments before. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were one of the disciples, I'd be feeling pretty beat up right now. You know, not only did we fail to do something that Jesus had had called us and equipped us to do, but Jesus comes down pretty hard on us. And he does it in public, no less. And I mean, who hasn't felt like they have failed to be who God wants them to be or failed to do what God wants them to do? But here's the thing. Jesus wasn't frustrated because he wanted more from his disciples. He was frustrated because he wanted less from them. And the disciples, they are, they're, they're pretty wounded, they're embarrassed, and they don't want to draw any more attention to their failure. So they wait until they're away from the crowd. And as it says in verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we do it? We've done it before. You've told us to do it. We cared for this boy. What's up with that? And Jesus replies, because you have so little faith. Because the disciples have so little faith. But yet a chapter earlier, we see Peter declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus affirms this to be, to be true. And the other disciples are there and they believe this. They have every reason to believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. And they have this front row seat to his ministry. And yet they have little faith. How is that possible? But you see, the, the faith with, that Jesus was looking for from his disciples and the faith that Jesus is asking us for today is not the faith of mere belief. But you see, we think that belief is what this thing called faith is all about, don't we? That if we just believe harder, then we'll have the kind of faith that Jesus has always wanted. And so we work so hard to believe with all of our might and to muster up all of this certainty. But don't, we don't just believe as hard as we can, but we, we try really hard to do big things for God, right? I mean, Jesus said the disciples had a little faith, so clearly he wants a big faith. And so we do all kinds of big things for God. We have big visions and big plans that we want to be the person that's known as making big things happen for, the, for him. You know, Greg Boyd has a metaphor for this faulty understanding of faith. And it's one of a carnival strength test. You know the test where you have a mallet and you have to hit a lever and a puck goes up a pole. When we think that faith is all about believing as hard as we can and, and doing big things for God, then we're holding a mallet in our hand. You know, if we have just enough belief, then we can hit that lever and send the puck up about a quarter of the way. And you know, at that point, we have saving faith. We haven't done a lot, but we've done enough to be saved. You know, but if we can muster up even more a belief and more certainty, and we can be just a little bit stronger, then we can hit that lever and send the puck up halfway. And at the halfway mark, guess what? Well, now you're at the basic blessing zone. You know, and, and here in the basic blessing zone, you're in the company of other believers who have financial security and successful relationships, and, and God is opening doors for them. But aha, there's more. Because if you have even more certainty and you try even harder in your faith and you hit that lever and it goes three quarters of the way up, well, now you are in the super blessed zone. I mean, who doesn't want to be in the, the super blessed zone, right? Because here God does miraculous and marvelous things in your life and you accomplish a lot for him. 
But you know, if you can have the ultimate amount of belief and certainty, and you have the ultimate strength, and you can hit that lever, and you can soar that puck up to hit that light at the top, well now, friends, you have the whatever you ask for level of faith. And we try and hit the faith puck up the faith pole, believing that if we can just do that, if we can just believe hard enough and have a big enough faith, then we'll have the kind of faith that God has always wanted us to have. And let's be honest, we wouldn't mind going home from the carnival with that big stuffed animal from the prize table, right? I mean, who doesn't want that? The people that have them, I mean, they act like it's this big burden, you know, oh, I have to find a spot to put this big animal or try and shove this thing in my car. But really, they're thinking, look what I did. Look what I won. And I know some of you are thinking you wouldn't want this silly stuffed animal anyways, but really, wouldn't you want the chance to decline it at least? You know, here you go. You win the prize. No, that's fine. You know, give it to the guy that only got it 25% of the way up. I have like whatever you ask for faith, give it to him. You know, this is not the kind of faith that God is calling us to. It is not about believing more or doing more or being more. No, that's not to say that belief is not important. Of course it is. We ought to have strong convictions and believe that God can and and will do incredible things. You know, it's also not to say that we shouldn't want to accomplish things for God. Of course we should. We should want God to do all kinds of kingdom things in and through our lives. But you know, where things start to get twisted and a little bit bent out of shape is when we start to think that we are the one responsible for getting stuff done. But you know, Jesus doesn't say that he wants a big faith. He says that he wants a small faith. He actually wants us to do less and to trust him more. You know, the word faith is the Greek word pistis. It means trust, reliability, commitment, assurance. And we see in Hebrews 11 verse 1, it defines faith saying faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And the word assurance here is the Greek word hypostasis. It re- refers to something's essence or something's substance. It's something that is, that is solid, something you can confidently stand on or lean against and trust. You see, the disciples failed to heal the boy because they failed to trust. They started to think that they could do it on their own. They started to rely on themselves and think, I've got this. But you know, this was not something that the disciples could do on their own. It was only something that God could do through them if they were living out a spirit of trust. Faith is not about just believing in God or having knowledge of God. It is all about stepping forward towards God and placing our trust in him. It is trusting him to be faithful to us and committing ourselves to be faithful to him in relationship. You know, I heard this definition of faith that looked at faith as a what versus faith as a who. And faith as a what looks at faith as a possession It's something that you have. It's convictions that you hold. Whereas faith as a who looks at faith as a person. It's a relational view. It's one that puts Jesus and what he did on the cross as the center and as the object of your faith. It's one that trusts him and and looks to him and follows him and depends on him and commits to him and calls out to him and places our hope in him. Faith is not something that you hold, but it is someone that you trust. And see, here's the thing. Jesus isn't just asking for us to trust him, but he's asking for our small trust. He continues the lesson with his disciples. 
in verse 20 saying, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, the mustard seed was the smallest of seeds in Jesus' day. We see earlier in Matthew that the emphasis on the mustard seed is that it grows to be the largest of the garden plants. This tiny, tiny seed grows to be a large tree that can provide refuge to birds. And Jesus is saying that small amount of faith has unlimited potential through my power. He's saying, let me accomplish the big thing through your small trust. And the phrase moving mountains, well, this was a pretty common Jewish phrase at the time for removing difficulties. To tear up or uproot or to pulverize or break down a mountain was to remove the barriers. And the phrase, nothing will be impossible for you, well, that echoes this Old Testament language that nothing is too hard for God. That with God, the impossible becomes possible. What Jesus is saying is, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say this mountain move from here to here and it will move and nothing will be impossible. By that he means, if you trust me, Everything that I call you to do will be impossible. Nothing is too hard for me to do if you place your small trust in me. If I call you to it and you trust me, I will see you through it. Will you stop trying to accomplish big things on your own? Will you stop trying to move the mountains or trying to be big enough for me to move the mountains for you? And will you stop and just trust me? Trust me to move the mountains in your life. I have a a fair amount of life lessons as it relates to trying to do big things for God. In fact, I got a two for the price of one from God a few years ago. And I was in the marketplace at the time and really sensed that God was calling me into ministry. And I didn't know what this looked like yet, but what I did know is that I wanted to do big things for God. I mean, kind of like a, a go big or go home launching into ministry. And my, my big thing that I wanted to do for God was to be an international missionary. To me, there was nothing bigger than giving up everything and everyone and moving overseas. And I did everything that I could to make that happen. I mean, I was having meetings with people. I was online. My kids had the How to Learn Spanish book, which is now collecting dust under their bed. And door after door after door closed. And finally, I had this aha moment that while I was certain God called me, who did I think I was to push this door open and make it happen on my own? And so I opened up my hands and I said, God, this is yours to make happen. You move this mountain. And he did. He closed the door. He very clearly closed the door. But, you know, he opened up a new one, one that was even better. It was beyond my wildest dreams and something I could have never come up with by myself. And it was to be part of a a global organization doing incredible work around the world that was located in London, Ontario two hours away from here. And a funny thing happened. As soon as that door started to creep open, I once again tried to do big things for God and to make big things happen because, you see, I figured he's calling me to compassion, so now i got to figure out a way to get there. And, you know, I couldn't do the, the top-level big thing of moving overseas, but maybe I can do the next-level big thing of moving to London And so I did everything in my power to make that happen, even though they didn't tell me yet that I had to do that. I I mean, I got a realtor. I had my mortgage pre-approval. My husband and I were driving two hours there and two hours back and two hours there and two hours back, looking and looking and looking and looking for houses. And door after door after door closed. And you know what? The entire time I'm thinking, this doesn't really feel great because... I'm pretty connected to my community at home and to my family. And my kids were pretty young at the time, one and three. And their village is here in St. Catharines. And it didn't feel right to me moving to a new city, not knowing 
what I would do with them if I'm working full time. But again, I thought, this is the big thing. I'll do it. I'll do it for God. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I'd been down this road before. And I had a little bit of a, hey, God, remember me? We talked about this mountain thing a few months ago. Well, here I am again, another mountain I'm trying to move. You know, will you take this one and just do with it what you will because I'm tired. And so we stopped. We stopped looking. And I showed up to work the first day on the job. I drove two hours there, planning to drive two hours home and planning to do that as long as it took for God to move this mountain and tell me what our family was supposed to do. And I had a meeting that changed everything that day. Because they looked at me and they said, you know, Allison, we really feel like you are called to work here. And we see the uniqueness of your family and how connected you are in your church community in particular. And that your village is there. And you know what? We don't want you to set up an office here in London. We don't want you to move here. In fact, why don't you set up an office in the comfort and chaos of your home? Be with your family and do what God called you to do. It was beyond my wildest dream. It was beyond anything I could have done on my own or imagined. You know, I went from moving overseas to moving to London to actually just staying put where God has called me to be. I trusted God to move those two mountains, and he moved them. And I know there are many people here who are struggling with this idea of faith the size of a mustard seed and, and struggling with a grim diagnosis and broken relationships and emotional battles. And you're hearing that you just don't have enough faith. Because if you had even this much trust, then God would move that mountain in your life. But as Mike said a few weeks ago, for reasons we don't understand and we can't explain, God has decided that the best way to deal with the pain and the suffering in our world is not to miraculously lift us out of it or to miraculously move every mountain, but instead to compassionately enter into it with us. And this is what Matthew reminds us of at the end of this section of scripture, and it says in verse 22, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. You see, the cross is the reminder that we can trust God in all circumstances. That when Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, he defeated the power of sin and darkness. And through Jesus, God is entering into our pain. And he is promising that no matter how much we suffer here on earth and no matter how many mountains we face, we can have hope and trust knowing that he has overcome the world. When we fix our eyes on the cross, we can trust that God is for us and he is not against us. And that one day he will wipe away every tear from our eye. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, but all of these things will be gone forever. And in the meantime, what God wants to do in and through your life may be different than what you want to see done. You may have a different idea about what mountain to move, but you will be amazed by what God ultimately does when you lift up your hands and you trust him. This is what the way of faith is all about. It is not a possession that you hold. It is a person that you trust. It is not about being more or believing more or doing more. It is about doing less and trusting him more. And so the question becomes, what is the mountain in your life? What is the mountain or the big thing that you are looking to accomplish 
on your own or the big thing that has been dropped into your life that needs to be moved, what is that mountain for you? And in what way are you trying to move it on your own or trying to be big enough for God to move it for you? And what would it look like for you to finally lift up your hands, stop worrying about what's going to happen when you do, and instead to just trust God to do what God is going to do and trust him to move what he is going to move so that you can live the life that he has called you to live. The way of Jesus and the way of faith is one of letting God accomplish his big things through our small trust. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that we can trust you to be who you were on the cross. God, would you help us to step forward towards you and to open up our hands and to trust you to trust you with the mountains in our life that we're trying to to create, that we're trying to move. And God, the ones that just feel overwhelming, that just don't seem to be moving. God, we thank you that you are trustworthy and that you are faithful. We thank you for what you have done and we thank you for what you will continue to do if we lift up our hands and we keep trusting you. Amen.